Um, yesterday, so uh, I explained that uh, how to compute entanglement entropy in fast integral picture, and uh, so we introduced a replica trick. And to okay, instead of directly calculating entanglement entropy, so you first uh, consider the Rennie entropy and take uh, analytic, uh, okay, analytical con analytic continuation with respect to the parameter n. So, so basically, you evaluate this guy, so trace of rho to the n. And so this is basically given by some n copies of uh, manifold, some manifold with uh, singularity here. But this singularity is, in general, at the boundary of the region A at constant time. So it is uh, basically uh, the dimension two singularity in, uh, in the d-dimensional manifold. So this is the Euclidean picture. And you glue uh, n copies of them together. And so this becomes a one sheet, uh, one manifold. So it is usually called n fold cover. And if you start with the flat space, then it is a n fold cover of flat space. And uh, uh, yeah, during the derivation, so I show that the, uh, the basically the modular Hamiltonian acts on this manifold. And in the simplest case, so the modular Hamiltonian uh, gives you a rotation. Or in the Lorentzian signature, it gives you a Lorentz boost. So, so this is also known as the Sognano Richman theorem. So basically, this is a Lorentzian signature. Uh, and uh, so here you have right window weight. So, so let's take a t equal to zero slice, and uh, you take a half space. So then the causal domain or domain of dependence of this region is given by this uh, shaded region. So then it is uh, shown by these uh, guys that uh, so the basically modular Hamiltonian, so Ka, so this is uh, defined as a, uh, by a minus log of the reduced density matrix, rho A. So it acts on only on this region, and it generates the Lorentz boost. And since the Lorentz boost can be even explicitly by this, so you know basically how to evaluate the modular Hamiltonian. So, so using the ratio, okay. So I, I, I think I showed you that uh, yesterday that uh, the relative entropy can be written as a difference of entanglement entropy and the difference of the modular Hamiltonian. So in simple cases, so you know how to calculate the relative entropy. But in general, so the the, the form of the modular Hamiltonian is not known in general. So uh, in general, it's not so easy to evaluate the, the relative entropy. But in simplest cases, so KA is explicitly known in this way. So, and uh, of course, okay, when you have a conformal symmetry, uh, then so you can make use of the conformal transformation. So, okay, so actually, so this is derived by Cassini field minus. So, okay, basically, so the conformal map is called CHM map. And uh, so they show that if theory is conformal and if you take a spherical region, then so the causal domain, this shaded region, is conformally equivalent to the Rindler wedge, the right Rindler wedge. So by performing the conformal transformation of the previous one, so you eventually end up with this formula. So. So when there is CFT and also the region A is a ball of say radius R, then you have also the local uh, expression given by the stress net. Right? So this is very nice because, okay, it, even in such a cases you can compare uh, you can compute the relative entropy for say between the ground states and some excited states. Oh, by the way, so I think this is the the modular Hamiltonian for. Okay, anyway, yeah, yeah, this is for, yes. So you can make use of this expression for the calculation. Okay, so, uh, so now, okay, uh, I don't think I have enough time to explain the, for, the, for the full detail, but the, if you calculate entropy, then in quantum theory, so there are many UV divergences. Uh,
So, okay, let's consider the D-dimensional quantum field theory. So I only talk about Euclidean signature. So, D means uh, D space, space, okay, okay, this is a Euclidean counting. So, in D dimension, so entanglement entropy for a spatial region A is known to have UV divergence of this form. So basically, the leading UV divergence starts with 1 over e to the d minus 2. So here, epsilon uh, is some small number, and this is basically the UV cutoff. And the subleading term uh, has, yeah, of course, this di UV divergent. So it is proportional to 1 over epsilon to d minus 4, and, and da, da, da. So you have parallel UV divergences. And depending on the dimensionality, uh, you have two cases. Okay, so let, let, me, let me continue to write the subleading term here. Uh, when dimension is even, so when d is even, you have log divergence. So this is a case when d is even. And when d is odd, you have a constant, some constant. Okay, so the reason why you have log UV divergence is that basically when you, okay, so d, the power, power of the UV divergence increases uh, in this way. So if you put, okay, when the exponent becomes zero, you basically replace uh, e to the epsilon to the zero with log. So that's why you have a log divergence. On the other hand, when d is odd, you don't get epsilon to, to zero. So there is no log UV divergence. So depending on dimensionality, so uh, entanglement entropy has different structure. And basically, so C naught and uh, gamma is, okay, basically called, universe. okay, it, in this case, uh, Okay, uh, there is another reason why you get the log. So basically in D dimension, so you have a conformal anomaly. So we have heard uh, the conformal anomaly from other talks by Bauk and also maybe Thomas also mentioned that, no? Okay. <laughs> yeah, so basically in D dimension, uh, there is a conformal anomaly. So the, the in the in even dimension, so, so due to the conformal anomaly, uh, uh, there appears there are there are log divergence. So. Um, if theory is conformal, yeah, completely conformal, so then, so when, um, okay, in, in CFT, I should say in CFT, then, so C naught is some non-trivial function. This is fixed by uh, conformal, okay, center charges. Center, a fixed by center of charge. Okay, so this is very misleading, yeah. So C is a kind of some function of center of charges. Center of charge times some structure, some, some geometric structure. So uh, in CFT, so C naught is basically determined by the shape of the region, and also it depends on the center of charges. So this term is uh, regarded as a universal, so which means that it doesn't depend on how you regularize UV divergences. So so this is also called UV yeah, UV. No, sorry, scheme independence, universal term. So this is universal term, 
And uh, okay, so this is a case in even dimension, but also in out D and when so if theory is CFT, so gamma is also universal. So th these guys are uh, called universal. So usually in quantum history, so if some uh, say suppose you compute some variable of some operators, and if it is UV divergent, you need some renormalization. So similarly, so entanglement entropy also needs some renormalization. And so, uh, but uh, if you look at the subleading terms, and if you find the lowest parts, then so if there is CFT, so C naught and gamma has some physical meaning. And uh, this will be uh, important when you talk about C theorem. Okay, um, okay, I, I do not uh, give you any derivation of this form, but uh, okay, this is basically what is known. And uh, there is also one, another important properties. So this is called area wall. So basically the most UV divergent term is always proportional to the area of the region. So we had a, so this is time slice. And we have, say, some region A. So basically, the leading UV divergence always proportional to the area of the region. So intuitively, yes? I'm sorry? Boundary? Boundary Right, right, yeah. Area means, yeah, boundary of the A. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. This is also misleading notation. So this means the volume of the boundary of the region A. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. Okay, so very intuitively, okay, this is very intuitive explanation. So basically, so you can regard the, the okay, there, there might be some many EPR pairs or Bell pairs uh, which are entangled across the boundary of the region A. So, so these EPR pairs contributes to the entanglement entropy mostly. So, so they, the, the UV divergences must be proportional to the volume of the boundary of A. So this is very intuitive uh, understanding of, of the area law. But of course, there are some cases where the area law, uh, area law is violated. But basically, so this law is, I think it, it is expected to hold for, uh, Hold for local quantum history. Okay, so this is the, the area row of uh, the entanglement entropy. And okay, if you calculate entanglement entropy for say, suppose, uh, say, free scalar, then you still have UV divergences. So uh, entanglement entropy is UV divergent for mostly general. Uh, field series. So it means that in, in quantum field theory, so the, it means that the QFT vacuum is highly entangled Okay, so you have UV divergences for most cases. I, I don't know any uh, okay, M maybe if theory is topological, then the UV divergence is milder, but uh, most, in most cases, the entropy is UV divergence, so it means that the vacuum is highly entangled. So even if the theory is, say, free, entropy is not so, yeah, entropy is still UV divergent. Okay, so this is uh, some uh, consequences. And now, so I, I'd like to move on to some applications. If you have, you don't have any question. Any question? Yes. Yeah. 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 So, how about excited state or the thermal state in QFT? 
I'm sorry, could you say again? Uh, uh, how about the entanglement entropy of the excited state or thermal state in QFT? Well, yeah, even for excited states, yeah, entropy is UV divergent. But if you measure the difference of entanglement entropies, it can be finite. Uh, will it violate the area law? Well, oh, I, are you asking the, the area law for excited states? Uh, yeah. I see. Um, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, actually, I, I don't know any general argument for that. Yeah. I, okay, here, so I only argue that the area law holds for QFT vacuum. Okay. But yeah, in general, pro probably it's true. Unless, yeah, unless the excitation is just low, yeah, unless the excitation is very irregular. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure, but yeah. yeah probably, yeah, it will hold even for such cases. But, but I think um, for thermal state, uh, what state, sorry? Uh, thermal state with, temp with thermal. finite temperature. Oh, yeah, 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 uh, great, great, yeah, 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 right, you're right. So, so now I'm talking about, say, Zero temperature case. Okay, okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Th thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let me let me uh, make a comment on that. So, at final temperature, so entanglement entropy has basically two contributions. One is from quantum entanglement. The other comes from Pascal. Pascal fluctuations. So basically, so especially, so okay, at final temperature, um, EE has a, a contributions. From quantum entanglement. And classical, say, thermal fluctuation. So, uh, at, say, when, when temperature is very high, then entanglement entropy approaches to the thermal entropy. Yeah. Yeah, especially in the, when temperature is infinite, then it agrees with thermal entropy. Thanks. Uh, uh, there is one question. Uh, Sorry. Uh, so, okay, okay, yeah. is uh, entanglement entropy I or finite? I'm, I'm sorry, entanglement uh, entropy what? Infrared finite. Uh, sorry. I mean, uh, I mean, you said the entanglement entropy is UV divergent. UV divergent. Yes. Is it infrared finite? Oh, infrared. Oh, okay. Okay, okay yeah, thanks. Okay. Entanglement entropy can have a IR divergence. Yes, yes. It could be a IR divergent. Yes. So in two dimension, in one plus one dimension, if you calculate entropy for massless sphere, then you see IR divergence. So in that sense, oh, so, okay. Basically, if you want to regulate the IR divergences, you should put your theory on the compact space. Yeah. Any question? Uh, QFT vacuum is uh, highly uh, entangled, then how to define scattering states in such a uh, uh, non-trivial entangled uh, vacuum? Scattering state? Yeah. Uh, sorry, but I don't understand, but uh, okay, why do you care about the entanglement and scattering? I mean, usually in QFT textbook, we, we just, in, in order to define scattering state, mm -hmm. we usually uh, assume the vacuum is trivial. But, uh, wow. You mentioned, I mean, uh, in general, QFT vacuum is highly entangled. Mm -hmm. Then, what is the vacuum for the uh, scattering state and asymptotic region? Well, they are not incompatible. I mean, having a, a nice asymptotic uh, states does not exclude the highly entangled states. I guess that
Sorry. I guess that the what uh, you mean by quantum field theory here means the quantum field theory with the gravity dual, which is not uh, very general but very special, right? Okay, so what I wanted to stress is, was that, okay, basically, so QFT vacuum is not a separable state in quantum mechanical sense. Any quantum field theory or uh, holographic no, I, I, dual? Um, no, no, uh, okay. So basically, even for free scalar theory, you see UV divergence, so which means that the free theory, okay, free, yeah, the QFT vacuum, so vacuum of the free theory is entangled state. So I guess then, uh, I guess the, what uh, uh, Dr. Yang say uh, is a relevant question that is, uh, I mean, if a quantum field of theory vacuum is highly entangled, uh, okay, can if, you make if, okay, if, elementary yeah. excitation? Sorry, so if, yeah, if states, vacuum states were separable, then entropy must vanish. All the separable but states. I just want yeah. to know that this whether this result, the area so called area law calculated uh -huh. here, uh -huh. is the consequence of a holographic calculation. No, no, this is purely field theoretical. I know that the, uh, in field theory, I guess that the only maybe very low dimensional theory uh, with a gap has a such a, is a proven for area law, but I'm not sure whether this is a hold for this, general. This is, this is very theory. general results. Yeah. Really. Yeah, yeah. I can give you some arguments if you mm -hmm. like. Le yeah, but maybe I'm running out of time, so le let me postpone it. All right. Yeah, if Thank yeah, you. later. Well, 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 yeah. This is yeah. This holds for mostly for any local quantum field theory. Okay, so uh, now I'd like to move on to the application. So applications of um, entanglement measures. So basically, uh, if I, I have a time, I want to uh, give you two applications. One is the constraints. on RG flows, so namely C theorem. The other is the application to deriving the bounds on energy and entropy. Okay, so let me start with the first one, so constraints on RG flows. So, so before that, let me uh, basically remind you, so what's the purpose of C theorem is. Uh, okay, so first, let me talk about, slightly talk about the C theorem. So basically, so when you talk about C theorem, so you are concerned with two theories. Uh, which are connected by some RG flow. So basically, so you have series space. So this is space of series. Okay, I will write script S. And you pick up two points. If, and if they, they are uh, connected by some non-trivial RG flow, then you talk about C theorem. Okay, so this is a basic setup, and okay, of course, not all to uh, not not for not all up here QFTs are connected by RG flow. So in that sense, so so okay, so you can introduce some partial order. By RG flow, so when when two series are rated by Connected by RG flow, then you can just say a partial order. So I use the same notation as in quantum information theory. So when I talk about the modularization, I use the 
uh, partial order or the Schmidt vectors. And similarly, so here I want to introduce a partial order for uh, a pair of quantum field series, so T1 or T2. Okay, so partial order means that, of course, okay, there are many series which cannot be connected by any RG flaws. So, so in that sense, it's a partial order. So, so then, so okay, we have similar structure already in say uh, two days ago or three days ago. So, <clears throat> we, uh, okay, in, in the context of quantum information, so we had a space of quantum states and we have quantum states there. So the T1, T2 were quantum states and we had a so-called LOCC operation. So now instead of LOCC, so we have RG flow and uh, now the quantum states uh, are replaced by quantum field series. So we have uh, exactly the same structure. And now, so we want to ask, so when, sorry, exactly the similar, same question. So when can say, when can T1 flow to another theory T2, okay? This is a, exactly the same type of question. So, um, so once you set up the partial order, then uh, you can similarly set up a so-called entanglement measure to quantify the order. So this is exactly the C theorem. So C, when you talk about C theorem, so you are concerned with constructing or finding so to quantify by the order between QFTs, so we want to find a so-called C function. But this C function is basically equal to the entanglement measure. Okay. So now you have a correspondence between QIT, so what we saw on QFT. So in QIT, so we had LOCC operation. But now here you have RG flow. And now so you have a lot of uh, okay. Before, so we have entangled states. And uh, in QFT size, of course, we have many non-trivial QFTs. And okay, we want to, okay, we also had a entanglement measure. And in QFT size, we want to introduce C function as a measure of the value of QFTs, basically. But of course, in QFT size, so we regard C function as a, a degrees of freedom in QFT. So our intuition tells us that uh, basically, if you go to the, uh, the, the lower energy scale, then the degrees of freedom, effective degrees of freedom, must also decrease Because if you have massive field, and if you go to the lower energy scale, the massive field is decoupled from your theory, effectively. So the degrees of freedom also monotonically decreases. That's our intuition. And uh, if you have C function, then you can quantify the degrees of freedom. Okay, so this is the basic motivation for the C theorem. But okay, in QIT side, so we also have a separable state. But uh, in QFT side, okay, so this is kind of speculation, my speculation. But okay, basically separable states are kind of trivial states or kind of invariant states on the LOCC. So LOCC cannot increase entanglement. So if you act LOCC on separable states, then you again get uh, obtain separable states. So in that sense, I think in QFT side, so the trivial theory 
Trivial means nothing. Trivial theory would be a counterpart of separable states. Well, this is basically my, my assumption. Okay, so <laughs> maybe there, there could be some more non-trivial theory which plays the similar role as separable states. But here, for simplicity, I, I just want to assume that uh, we only have a trivial states or trivial theory as a separable states. Okay, so let me assume that. So then, so I want to play the same game as before. So now we want to construct, so we want to construct a C function. So C function basically has to satisfy that if uh, there is a flow from T1 to T2, then uh, <coughs> C function, the value of C function at T1 is greater than uh, C of T2. So this is a basic property. So we need to find such a function. But we have already learned that uh, how to construct a nice function using the relative entropy. So we have several examples. So let's naively apply apply the, the previous construction. Okay. So but before that, let me, let me write uh, just a figure. So this is a space of QFT, and you have two series connected by RG flow. Then C function gives you a height. Okay, this is basically height, height function. So this is basically a height function on the space of QFT. And you have a flow in the height function. So, so basically, C of T1 is greater than C of T2. So if you compare the values of C function for each series, then if one of them is greater than the other, then you might have uh, some RG flow. But okay, in this case, so there might be some RG flow from T1 to T2. But uh, the opposite, the converse is not true. So there is no flow from T2 to T1. So this is the consequence of C function. OK. Good. OK, so this is basically the formal argument for C, C theorem. Yes? Uh, does the C uh, T1? Uh, uh, is more than C T two means that there is uh, there ex exact uh, R G flow that can makes the theory T one to T two, or it means that uh, if we have uh, the C T one is uh, maximal than a uh, maximal than T uh, C T two, that means it can be an R G flow, but it's we, we we are not sure whether we can find it. No. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. So. Okay, in this figure, I or I, okay, I started with uh, some series, a pair of series, which are connected by RG flow. Okay, more generally, of course, okay, of course, you are not sure the, these two series are connected by RG flow. Okay, so this is a more general situation. So given a pair of two QFTs, if you have C function, you you and if you know how to calculate the C, the value of C function. Then first you compute the values of C for each and compare them. And suppose C T1 is greater than C T2. Then so what you can say is that okay, okay if if C T1 is greater than C T2, what you can say is that there is no RG flow from T2 to T1, OK? This is the implication, OK? It, it doesn't mean that uh, there exists an RG flow from T1 to T2, OK? So this is, OK, we, we don't know there exists RG flow, but you cannot exclude RG flow, OK? <laughs> what you can exclude is that the opposite is not true, OK? 
Okay, I, I should I should write like this. Okay, in this case, uh, there is no such an RG flow. So no RG flow. No RG flow from T two to T one. Okay. So yes. When you say uh, C function, you give up a property that C function a derivative vanishes on the fixed point. Uh, could you say again? Uh, derivative of C function is what? Vanishes around the fixed point. No, no. This this is a weak form. Yeah. This is weak version of C theorem. Okay. There are three versions of C theorems. One is weak version here. Uh, the the strong strong version requires a monotonicity between the, say the flow. Okay, and the third one is strongest. Strongest one requires stationarity of the derivative. Yes, but uh, now I only consider the weak weak version at this moment. Okay, thanks. So uh, actually, yeah, there are many examples of C theorems. Okay, so there are of course some theoretical motivations, but of course we ha we know many examples, so so that's why we expect uh, C theorem holds for in general. And of course, the famous most famous example is the two-dimensional case is Zamoroshkov C theorem. So Zamoroshkov C theorem. Uh, states that if you compare the value of central charges at a fixed point, then the central charge of UV is always greater or equal to the IR value. So C is central charge in two dimension. Oh, okay. Now I understand why you asked me that, that question. Okay. So here, Right, so I'm writing strong version. Sorry, yeah, this is strong version. I do not assume that T1 and T2 are CFTs. Sorry, yeah, so this is a strong version of the C theorem. Yes. Yes? Uh, I'm wondering um, why RG flow will pick up a so-called direction. And uh, by using this, we can uh, define the partial order. Uh, I mean, uh, if, uh, if we can use a, a parameter to, uh, to, to, to give, a, uh, give, us, give an order of, the, uh, of a series of series, and, uh, but, uh, we we can take the maybe the minus lambda, right? We we, we can use the minus lambda to reorder the series, right? Mm -hmm. So um, in this way, uh, the direction change. So uh, so uh, so so this is what I mean. Uh, why we can. Uh, why? Why if we get a uh, a a RG flow, then uh, it will pick up a direction. I mean, uh, we can use the lambda to uh, parameterize it, and uh, we 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 can also use the minus lambda to parameterize it. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. I think. Yeah. So if C function is satisfy, yeah, is the strongest version. So you can show that the, the it is the, the derivative vanishes around the fixed point. So in that case, it doesn't matter which sign you use because it starts with from lambda square. But if it's it's not the strongest version, oh, okay. it may depend on okay. the direction. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I get it. Okay. Um, let me quickly uh, give you a few examples and uh, a few conjectures. Okay, so basically this is a 2D case, and probably both, yeah, most of you are have heard of that before. And there is a um, 4D version. So in D equal four, 
there are also uh, there is also C theorem, but it's not called C theorem, but A theorem. So A theorem argue that okay, there are two central charges of conformal anomaly. So and and one of them is called A. So A actually plays a role of C function. So this is the A theorem. Uh, first it conjectured by Cardi. I don't remember when he conjectured, but uh, 80 or 90, early 90s. And the uh, proof so was given by Komar Rogowski, Schwimmer. Uh, okay, so these are kind of established. But, but okay, basically you can play the same game and uh, in, in higher even dimension. Okay, so if you go to in higher even dimension, uh, basically, so you can classify the conformal anomalies in two types. So basically, conformal anomaly means that classically, the trace of the stress tensor vanishes. So we, we run this from about this lecture. But classically, so it vanishes, but quantum mechanically, it's, it's not zero. So okay, in my convention, okay, my convention, um, okay. Basically, there are two terms. One is proportional to the Euler density. So this is Euler density. So, okay, then the, their coefficient is usually denoted by A. So this is the A central church, and there are many uh, B-type central churches. The others are the coefficient of so-called bio-invariance. And depending on the dimensionality, so you have many, many wire invariants. In two dimension, there are no wire invariants, in, but in four dimension, you have one only one wire invariant. And if you go to six dimension, there are three wire invariants. So uh, depending on the dimensionality, the numbers of B type B anomalies varies. Okay, but there is only uh, one A anomaly. So so A B are central charges. Okay, in, okay, in even dimensional CFT, yes. I only talk about CFTs. So, okay, A and B eyes are central charges, and uh, in two dimensions, and also in four dimensions, A central charges plays the role of C function. So, so this is, of course, a conjecture, so there are, there are no proofs. So the conjecture is that it is I think it is expected that uh, in, in, in higher dimensions, in A B D, so A central charge plays a role of C, C function. So this is a conjecture. But if you go to, the, say, the odd dimension, okay, in odd dimension, so there are no, no conformal anomaly. So it's not clear what to use as a C function. But uh, in the original paper by Cardi, uh, he actually uses a sphere version function to extract the A anomaly. Okay, if you uh, look at the definition of A anomaly, so A is a coefficient of the Euler density. So if you calculate the web of the stress tensor, oh, sorry, tr trace of the stress tensor on the sphere, then you can only pick up the, the, AI, the A, A anomaly, so not wire invariance. So wire invariance means that uh, uh, it, it behaves uh, well under the wire transformation, and there is a wire transformation from flat space to a sphere. So flat space does not have any curvature. So, okay, okay, I didn't explain the detail of wire invariance, but it is it consists of Riemann curvatures. So, okay, so these are a function of Riemann curvatures, Riemann tensors. So on the flat space, wire invariance vanishes, vanish completely. 
but the on sphere, so okay, Euler density is topological invariant. So ED, so integrated over sphere, gives you two. So okay, basically, Cardi actually uses a sphere to extract the A anomaly. So even in odd dimensions, uh, it is highly natural to use the sphere version function. And uh, there is a conjecture uh, of this form. Basically, in all dimension, uh, there is a conjecture. called F theorem. So F theorem argue that uh, the sphere, sphere partial function, actually you need to take a log and you need uh, some sign factor. So you first put your CFT on sphere and calculate the partial function. So Z of SD means that sphere partial function. And you take a log, and th this guy is basically called sphere free energy. And this sign factor is kind of convention to make F be positive. Of course, there is no, no proof for that, for the positivity. But in simple cases, with this convention, F can be positive. Uh, there are some exceptions in higher structures, but yeah. Okay, so this is a conjecture called the F theorem. So or first proposed by Kurebanov and his, his collaborators. Okay, this is conjecture in all dimension, but there, okay, there are more general conjectures unifying these two. So basically, th this is also called A, A theorem in even dimension, and you have, uh, on the other hand, you have F theorem in odd dimension. But it's, yeah, it would be nice if you could unify these two. And there is a very interesting proposal in general dimension, in general D. There is a, also another conjecture or proposal uh, called Generalized F theorem. Of course, this is also conjecture. And in this case, uh, F tilde, so you define new C function, F tilde, and F tilde takes a very interesting form. So F tilde is basically given by the sphere partial function, but you multiply sine function. Okay? So when D is odd, then F tilde reduces to the F previous in the previous page. So so F tilde is equal to f in of d while um, it, okay, in my convention it becomes pi half times a in even dimension. Okay, by the way, so I, I okay, when, you, when you define this guy, so you implicitly uh, <laughs> use the dimensional regularization. So this is basic assumption. Okay, and probably some of you were worried about the UV divergences for the partial function. Uh, if you use, say, the dimensional regularization, then F tilde uh, becomes finite. Okay. Okay, so this is uh, uh, probably the one of the most general uh, conjecture for C theorem in any dimensions. So uh, there are many conjectures and uh, now, so I'd, I'd like to, okay. yeah, I'd like to uh, rewrite these conjectures with uh, the entanglement measures. Okay, this is a brief review of C theorems. Any question? Yes. 
this generalized F theorem uh, compares the entanglement entropy with between two CFTs, right? Sorry, uh, uh, interpolate. Uh, inter- uh, I mean, compares the uh, entanglement property between two CFTs. So, is there any statement about a two QFT? Any statement about two QFT? Oh, I see. So, you, so this this compares only for fixed points. So, you are asking whether there is a, a C theorem for more stronger form. Huh. Um. Actually, I, I don't know any conjecture. Or, okay, this is the weakest form. Uh, okay, well, yeah, that's a good point. Um, I think in some program context, yeah, there is some proposal. Basically, you're supposed to use F tilde or F as an interpolating function. Yeah, yeah there, there are some yeah, conjectures. Okay, any question? Okay, so now so it's time to uh, go back to the entanglement measure. Okay, so um, in the, I think in the first lecture or second lecture, so we define we define so called the relative entropy of entanglement as an entanglement measure. Okay, let me remind you uh, how I defined the relative entropy of entanglement. Okay, this is the relative entropy of entanglement. So basically, so, okay, now so we are dealing with the theory. So instead of having a density matrix, we have some theory as an argument. And the relative entropy of entanglement uh, was, is defined as a distance or the difference, namely the relative entropy between two states. So T and some separable, say separable, States, but separable states, okay, T prime. So this is supposed to be some separable state denoted by X. But uh, yeah, okay, by assumption. Okay. So I assume that uh, okay, separable states are given by trivial theory. So okay, this is my big assumption. So you just compare the two theories, T, the given theory, and Trivial theory. So this is trivial theory. Okay. So then, okay. So we know how to compute the relative entropy in quantum theory. Basically, you use this form. So the relative entropy is the difference of the modular Hamiltonian minus the difference of the entanglement entropy. And here, K0 means that uh, this is basically the modular Hamiltonian for trivial theory. Okay? And in general, okay, of course we don't know the precise form of K in general, but now, so I'd like to focus on the spherical region or say half, half space. Okay? Then, so okay, when, when the region A is spherical, Okay, thanks to the CHM map, so K naught is roughly given by integral of something times T naught naught. Okay, when A is spherical, K naught is given some, something, some integral of the stress tensor. But the trivial theory does not have stress tensor, so K naught becomes zero for trivial theory. So, so we can safely ignore the first term, and we, but we still have the difference of the entanglement entropy. And of course, this is also by definition. So the trivial theory does not have any entanglement entropy because there is no divisor freedom. So the delta S is nothing but the entanglement entropy of, of the given theory T. 
and let's suppose that uh, the A is the spherical region of the radius R, R. So then, so what we found is that basically the relative entropy, sorry, this is very confusing notation. So uh, let me change the notation of the relative entropy. Okay, I, I write rel here to distinguish uh, that this subscript with the radius of, of sphere. Okay, now, okay, the relative entropy of entanglement for a theory T is given by minus the entanglement entropy. Okay? Okay. So basically, so we just ended up with the entanglement entropy. So also we started with the relative entropy of entanglement, whose definition is highly non-trivial. Uh, under under uh, my assumption, so you end up with minus the entanglement entropy. So, um, <clears throat> okay, so here so I'd like to uh, emphasize that okay, this guy, so entanglement entropy or spherical region is defined for any QFT, not only for CFT, but also for any QFT, okay? Because you can always define entanglement entropy for any QFT, okay? Not only for CFT. So, um, so now we, we want to apply the monotonicity. The monotonicity of the relative en entropy of entanglement. Because the relative entropy of entanglement has monotonicity property, so what we can say is that basically uh, in, in quantum field theory, so we have already saw that the the under the inclusion of the space-time region, the relative entropy monotonically decreases. So suppose that you have two two causal diamond, and one is u, and the other one is u tilde, for instance. Then, so if u tilde is included in u, then the relative entropy for u tilde is less than relative entropy for u. Okay, here I I didn't write the argument, but this is basically I'm comparing some QFT T with trivial theory. Okay. So from the mountain state, uh, so what we can say is that basically, so we can say that the entanglement entropy also satisfies inequality. So if you shrink the size, the radius, then entropy also decreases. So this is the implication of the mountain density. But some of you may notice that, okay, this is kind of boring results because, okay, basically uh, entanglement entropy itself is UV divergent. So, um, and it, so the, the leading UV divergence is also proportional to the, the area of the region. So what you can say is that, okay, let's, let's remind that, uh, that, okay, so entanglement entropy for the border region has, okay, there is some unknown coefficient alpha, and you have leading UV divergent term and plus subleadings. So it is always proportional to this guy, the area. And if you shrink the size, okay, if you shrink the size of the region, this part decreases, of course. So the previous inequality gives you the positivity of alpha. So this is a uh, one consequence. And I, actually, I, I don't know any uh, proof for this positivity using another yeah, alternative argument. Okay, I, I'm not sure this is known in general, but anyway, this is one consequence. But this is boring because what we want to show is that, okay, eventually, okay, I'm going to uh, show you that 
actually the universal part. This is the universal part. I want to show that the, the universal part plays a role of C function. So okay, so so R, the positivity of alpha is not what I want to show. So I want to show that the, the monotonicity of this guy. Actually, okay, so so here is a surprise. Okay, so okay, so for okay, maybe I. Yes. Okay, uh, so in this setup, okay, so there is also one more on the surprise. Uh, so we want to prove uh, the F theorem or general F theorem, but uh, if theory is for CFT, so if theory is CFT or CFT. Uh, with spherical region. Of radius r, then you can show that. Okay, this is very surprising. You can show that the entanglement entropy of spherical region is equal to the log of the sphere Persian function. So this is highly non-trivial result. So this is also uh, proved by Cassini and Myers. OK, so this is surprising because the, on the left-hand side, you calculate entanglement entropy. Okay. On the right-hand side, you are calculating the Euclidean Prussian function. Okay. Of course, if you use the replica trick and conformal symmetry, then you can prove, you can derive this equality. But this is very highly non-trivial. And OK, so, but here I have equality, but this equality holds up to UV divergence, that UV divergences. So the correct statement is that if you pick up the universal part on both sides, then they agree. Okay, so this is a precise statement. But now, so then, so once you know this uh, relation, this relation, then so you you have a hope to prove the epsilon, so or general epsilon, because. So when you uh, define the general S theorem, so you used sphere partial function, but uh, it is related to the uh, spherical entanglement entropy. So and uh, once you map it to the entanglement entropy, so you can uh, take advantage of the inequalities or the entanglement entropy. So maybe you can prove some non-trivial statement. Okay, so this is the idea. Uh, So okay, so more precisely, so, okay, it follows from CHM map that okay, so F tilde for CFT, okay, of course, of course, F tilde is all, maybe only defined for CFT, but okay, using the ratio, so F tilde is calculated with. Sorry, it's not a good combination. This is R. So F tilde is given by sine function times spherical entanglement entropy. Of course, this is also up to UV divergence, but I assume that uh, assume the dimensional regularization. So, so basically, if you calculate the right hand side, then it is automatically finite. You finite. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. So, but okay. We 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 have already tried to apply the potency of the rate of entropy of entanglement, but we couldn't get uh, any non-trivial bounds, any non-trivial inequalities for F tilde. So we need another. Okay. We need to come up with some nice better measure, so which does not have any UV divergences. And actually, so uh, Cassini and his collaborators constructed. Uh, pretty much nice 
uh, uh, modeling yeah, quantity. Okay, so, so now we want to prove. Now we want to prove to show the monotonicity. of F tilde using um, okay using an inequalities of entanglement so okay, this is the idea okay so but Actually, so you need to cancel or you need to subtract the UV divergent term to obtain non trivial inequalities for F tilde. Because entanglement ent entropy itself is, has very strong UV divergences. But, uh, okay, okay, from this ratio, so it's clear that uh, this implies that, so this, this ratio implies that you need to read off the finite term. Okay, basically you have UV divergences. And okay, I, I'm very sloppy about the, the coefficient, but basically the universal term is given by F tilde. So this is a finite term. So you, you want to cancel these UV divergences to obtain non-trivial inequalities for F tilde. And now, so, this is highly non-trivial, but uh, you first, okay, let's define. Um, new function, so which depends on the size of the spherical region R and cell T. And this function is defined in this way. So basically you act differential operator of this type, this form. Um, the entanglement entropy of the spherical region. Okay, again, so this is also well defined for any QFT. Okay, not, not only for CFT, but it is also defined for any QFT. But you subtract the UV theory of this, this, uh, this T. There is a, some UV theory, so you subtract it, subtract the entropy, like this. And what uh, Cassini and his collaborator showed is that basically, okay, this is a several paper, uh, but there are several papers, but okay, basically, uh, Cassini and his collaborators show that, so they show that this function is motorically degreasing. Okay, this basically this, this inequality follows from the monotonicity of entanglement entropy or relative entropy. So I, I, I won't uh, show you how to derive this, but uh, yeah, basically, so there are many papers discussing, yeah, discussing this derivation. So the one implication of this inequality is that basically C, C itself is negative. Okay, so here, so it, it's a little bit tricky because, okay, this is because if you, okay, basically if you take R to be zero, then this part should agree with the entanglement entropy at UV fixed point. Now, so we implicitly assume that uh, the size gives you some R G scale. So if you shrink the region, the size of the region, then you were looking at UV fixed point. On the other hand, if you uh, have a larger and larger uh, regions, then you end up with IR theory. So this is kind of one assumption. So if you take R to be zero, then these two cancel to each other. So, so this is highly non-trivial assumption, okay. But uh, basically, so when you take R equal to zero, these two cancels and the C vanishes. And this inequality implies that uh, C is non-positive. Okay, so this is uh, the one 
monotonic property, a monotonic function. And actually, so using this function, so you can prove several uh, C theorems. Okay, let me show you how. Okay, um, let's start with two dimension. In two dimension, so basically, so if there is conformal, then in two dimension, basically, you cannot have a sphere, but you, you can only have interval of with this R, then it is known that entropy is logarithmically divergent, okay? And plus something, some constant term. And okay, let's substitute this guy into the, um, the modern <laughs> function here. But okay, now, so I want to specialize that, okay, where, okay, I, I'm gonna take T to be um, I, the IR theory, okay, the IR theory. So now I'm going to take the IR theory as an argument. So there, so this is, okay, when D equal to, you have a derivative operator acting on S, okay. Okay, let me, let me try to change the notation. Okay, you have a difference between, you know, of the entanglement entropy between IR and UV. And I assume that, uh, okay, basically when there is CFT, it should take this one. So, so what you get is that um, you have the difference of the center charges divided by three, okay? And, okay, as I said, so, okay, this C is always non-negative, sorry, non-positive. So it gives you the C theorem. Okay, very good. Um, and similarly, you can yeah, you can go to three dimension and you can also show the F theorem. Okay, let me give you how, how it works in three dimension. Now you have a disk, disk region. So this is a radius R disk. And in this case, you have UV power law divergence. But the UV divergent term is proportional to the area, sorry, okay, or yeah, area of the region, two by R. And okay, this is also convention, but the finite term is written as minus F. So minus comes from just a convention. So now you calculate the value of C at IR fixed point. Now, so you have a derivative operator. R D R minus one, and so here you have a difference of entanglement entropies. So um, you have okay. So alpha may depends on the series. Okay, so you would get something like this: alpha I R minus alpha U V times two pi R over epsilon, and here you have minus F I R minus FUV, but by construction, so this derivative operator kills the first term. So by, by construction, but uh, okay, the derivative trivial acts on the second. So you end up with, you end up with FIR minus FUV, and this is again non-positive, Okay, and this is exactly what we want to show. Okay, and you can similarly play the same game in four dimensions. Let me quickly give you, or oh, maybe, yeah, I don't have to. Okay, actually, yeah, this, yeah, this types of argument works 
in four, up to four dimension. So in four dimension, yeah, actually yeah, this is what we can say at most from the motricity. Uh, basically, so you have R squared term plus, um, actually I don't remember my convention of A. Okay, I think in my convention, this must be minus A. Okay, and similarly you calculate the IR value of C. And again, so you act, act this derivative operator, but uh, it's kind of trivial that this operator kills the first leading parallel divergence. So I won't show you this term. Okay. Basically, so you have something times R squared, and you have second term, minus AIR minus AUV times log. And then, so you end up with twice AIR minus A U V times log and plus finite term. So then this is also again non-positive. And of course uh, R is greater than epsilon. So this is a UV cutoff scale, so which is smallest. So this part is positive. So you end up with the A theorem. Okay, so far, so, so good. But probably some of you already noticed that, okay, if you go to say five dimension or more than five dimensions, you have more UV divergent terms, which cannot be canceled by this operator. So, okay, you can only prove the C theorems when D is less than four, sorry, less than y equal to four. If you go to higher dimensions, this construction doesn't work. So, um, in summary, um, in D greater than or equal to five, C is still UV divergent. Okay, of course, in, even in four dimension, uh, it is UV divergent, but it's logarithmically UV divergent. But, you, but you, CIR has parallel UV divergences. And what you can show is that basically, okay, in higher dimensions, um, you have UV divergent terms. And okay, I, I use alpha for the first coefficient. And in the second, I use beta. And what you can show is that basically, so this, this beta, you can show some monotonicity for beta. What you can show is that basically beta IR is greater than or equal to UV value of beta. So this is the consequence of the monotonicity of C in higher dimensions. But this is not equal to the X theorem or A theorem. Okay, so okay, basically this is the end of the story about theorem and entanglement entropy. So if you have any question, please ask. Yes? Yes? I'm sorry? This entropy on the base of a positive degree freedom. How about including the uh, formula? Uh, what's the volume? Uh, uh, formula, uh, including formula. What happens? Ah, fermium. Right. Oh, okay. Even including fermions, you have similar result. Yeah. Also, you have the both of them, the UV and the IR, in, you know, single activity, include what happens? I'm sorry. You have the only focus on the UV singularity, right? I have, yeah, I suppose there is a UV theory, the UV, theory, the UV, the UV, UV and the IR singularity. 
Singularity of what? Sorry. Both of them, the UV IR singularity. Oh, you mean the UV divergence yeah, and IR divergence? Yeah, okay. Yeah. And the ah, okay. Um, I think yeah, that's a very good point. And uh, okay, basically, so you, okay, this problem. Okay, now I only consider the UV divergence problems. And if you have uh, IR divergences, but basically yeah, you can regulate IR divergences by putting your theory on of space. But of course, this type of argument doesn't work because I. Yeah, this argument relies on space-time roughness. So yeah, so I, I don't know how to regularize IR divergence in general and prove so prove the C theorem. But yeah, but probably yeah, this type of argument is also true even in the presence of IR divergences. Yeah, actually yeah, there is okay. Basically okay, the generalized F coefficient is not guaranteed to be positive. There is no proof for the positivity of this guy. So, yeah, if you never calculate FQ, then it could be minus. So, it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean uh, it's meaningless as a degree of freedom. So, it is a big, yeah, big question. Okay, uh, you have 10 minutes? Okay, yeah. 10 minutes? Well, yeah, yeah if, if it's 10 minutes, yeah, I, I will finish in 10 minutes. Okay? Uh, any question? Oh, yeah. Uh, <coughs> when we compare the quantum information theory and QFT, you <coughs> Map the ROCC as a RG flow. Yes. Um, but ROCC preserve the separability of the separ separable state, and RG is the analog of ROCC. So I thought the separable state will be uh, mapped into RG fixed point. But you. Yeah. Good question. I think. Okay. Yeah. Basically, so given some theory, at least if you have a Lagrangian description, you can make some relevant perturbation to trigger RG flow. So unless theory is trivial, you still have non-trivial RG flow. So CFT is not necessarily their, say, free states or separable states in that sense. Yeah. That's, that's my assumption. It, this argument is kind of very Speculative. So, <laughs> uh, so uh, when you uh, discuss a relative entropy of you know, entanglement as a C function, mm -hmm. uh, I didn't quite get uh, what do you mean by trivial theory. Trivial theory means there is nothing, so you don't have no you, you have no field. No. Okay, if you start with massive theory, then you can make mass to be very large, then you end up with nothing. That's what I mean by trivial. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um. Uh, in the original theory, you know, in the original work of the C theorem, the author constructed uh, the C function that is uh, also applicable to the any point on the RG trajectory, not just at the fixed point. So, uh, can the entanglement measure reproduce uh, this uh, C function, not just at the fixed point? So, you specifically asking the relation between the morphical C function and the entropic C function here? Uh, in, in 2D CFT, Jama Dovsky. Oh, okay, function. okay, Komarovsky Schimmer. Actually, I don't know uh, any precise relation between them. Okay, basically. In two dimensions, so there is a Zamoskov C function, which is also monotonic. But okay, Zamoskov C function is very strong in the sense that uh, it is monotonically degreasing and also it is stationary. So it is a strongest version of C theorem. On the other hand, here, okay, you can construct so called entropic C function of this type. And entropic C function is only the strong version, strong C function, not the strongest. So they are different. 
in four dimension, I think uh, entropic C function is also just a strong version, or possibly just a weak version. Yeah. I have a question. Um, as you say, the LCC, the action of LCC will lower down the entanglement, right? Lower entanglement. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Um, so how, uh, how can we compare two different entanglement entropy where both of them are suffer from the UV divergent? How, uh, your question is how to compare two different uh, entanglement entropy. Two different entanglement entropy. Uh, in QFT. Because both of them are suffer from uh -huh. they, they UV divergent. UV divergent. Yeah. Well, well, yeah, that's a good point. So you need to use the same, the same UV cutoff. Yeah, you compare, okay. it, yeah, compare two states. Yes, yes. Yeah, that's oh. good point. You okay. have to specify your regularization or cutoff first, and then compute entropy and compare these two. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Since I, I only have five minutes, so <laughs> let me quickly. Um, outline what you can show, what you can derive for the bounds on energy and entropy. Okay, I only, I only sketch uh, what is known for the bounds on energy and entropy. So first, okay, in the previous lectures, um, Okay, from the positivity or non-negativity of the relative entropy, so we, sh we saw that the, the difference of the entanglement entropy between rho and sigma is bounded by the difference of the modular Hamiltonian. So uh, if we apply this inequality for, say, okay, let, let's take sigma, the uh, vacuum, And if, let's just consider for simplicity of the spherical region. And in CFT and, and the region A is sphere, spherical. So then we know how to write the modular Hamiltonian here because we, we know the explicit form. So it takes roughly this form. Um, K sigma is roughly uh, some integral in inside the ball, ball region, and times the energy, T not now. So this is the energy. But by the way, so this K is by definition dimensionless. And here you have some length scale R and T not not gives you some energy density. And you are integrating this guy. So this must proportion to the uh, typically R times energy. So this energy means that energy contained in, inside the ball, okay? So this is the energy, energy for, okay, I, I should write that the delta K is roughly speaking, here I, I have, I'm taking delta and also here, and then, so it must be given by R, the typical size of sphere times the energy for the, for rho. So this is the energy for rho. So then, so you have a bound, so for the entropy. So this is yeah, a kind of refinement of the so-called Bekenstein bound. So this is a refinement of of so-called Bekenstein bound. And this is one application of the positivity of relative entropy. And more non-trivial one is so-called the derivation of averaged null energy condition. So this is usually called ANIC. So ANIC means that if you calculate the wave of the stress tensor, but that you integrate the wave of stress tensor along the light light wave direction. So this is the right wave direction. 
and basically you integrate the energy density along along this line then uh, for any states for any state okay this now the baby is taken for any state which has finite energy then ANIC argues that it is always non-negative so this is the ANIC so called ANIC and if you assume ANIC then you can derive non-trivial uh, you can say non-trivial uh, bound so one example is Hoffman Balasena bound and Hoffman Balasena bound is a uh, the bound for the ratio between A anomaly and C anomaly. Okay, by the way, C anomaly is type B anomaly in four dimension. So this is for 4 D. Um, sorry, I don't remember the precise coefficient, but I think one third. Yeah, the next one is one third, and right is thirty one over eighteen. Okay, so this is a consequence of A neck, and so okay, this is highly non-trivial bound, and you can prove this A neck using the properties of relative entropy. And uh, if I have time, I, I wanted to, yeah, derive this guy starting from the monotonicity. But the basic idea is that okay, let me yeah outline the basic idea. So basically, uh, okay, here so you there appears in the integration of the stress energy tensor. So the basic idea is that. So you st start with some half line. So this is half line region, and you know what the modular Hamiltonian is for ha for half space. For half space, you know the, the form of the modular Hamiltonian. So this is basically x one times t not not, and now so you have second. Uh, Region. Okay, I should change the color. And you take another, another slice. And uh, okay, here you have another region B. And whose domain of dependence is included in the domain of dependence of A. So you take, you basically take another region B such that the domain of dependence of B is the subset of the domain of dependence of A. Okay? So then, so you can apply the monotonicity of relative entropy. So monotonicity of relative entropy uh, gives you the monotonicity of the so-called full, full modular Hamiltonian. Actually, I defined the relative full modular Hamiltonian, but when two states are equal, then you get the so-called full modular Hamiltonian. So Ka is defined by the modular Hamiltonian for the region A minus Ka bar. So this is the definition. And you can prove this type of monotonicity from the relative entropy. So then, basically, the idea is that, okay, you compare these two states and you slightly shift the, the, this region. You, the B is very close to the region A. In that case, from this monotonicity, uh, you can obtain some non-trivial uh, in quality, including the stress tensor. And okay, and then so you just uh, yeah eventually you end up with the ANIC. So the proof uh, was given by Paul and his collaborators. Maybe seventeen, uh, maybe maybe sixteen. Sixteen. A few years ago, so if you are interested in, yeah, yeah, please take a look. And then, so you you will see that the, the basic idea is that this, this, and you, this is very important. So, the the form of the modular Hamiltonian is very important, and also the monotonicity of the full modular Hamiltonian is very important in the proof. But th these are the, basically the two building blocks. Okay, uh, I'd like to finish here. And thank you very much. Okay, just one question, and then uh, we have a Q&A session.
I'd like to ask you the, uh, among the all the results you presented today, uh, is there any result which depend on the presence of a supersymmetry or a holography? Sorry, uh, your question is, uh, is there any result using supersymmetry? Among um, your, re uh, I mean, presented re result, uh -huh. uh, is there any result which depend on the presence of a supersymmetry or presence of a holography in the theory? Or it is a completely independent of these two? Okay, so in here, so these uh, results are independent of supersymmetry. So it, it is a very general result. Because, okay, here, so you have some stress tensor, and uh, you take a bed for any state, but any state with finite energy. And as long as the state has finite energy, so any holds. Okay, on, but on the flat space, so this is on flat space. There, there are also some uh, conjectures on, on the curved space, but uh, yeah, there are many counterexamples also. So, but okay, on flat space, this holds. And this does not rely on any, anything other than QFT. This is highly general argument. F theorem, yeah, F theorem is also is independent of supersymmetry and etc. Yeah, yeah. But if you have supersymmetries, you can prove so-called F maximization by Thomas and his collaborators. It is an analog of A maximization in four dimension. Yeah. But we, yeah. Yeah, historically, yeah, F maximization is proved. Oh, well, is it after the F theorem? I, I don't remember the order, but anyway, yeah. If you have supersymmetry, yeah, you can prove so-called F maximization, which is also consistent with the F theorem. Yeah. 